is the same as the title of my book that was published in June of this year. And the goal of the talk and the book is to provide you with provocative new ways of addressing the lack of IT security. I'm going to give you a couple of relatively recent examples of data breaches that affected Iceland in one way or another. Then I will cover a security awareness experiment that I performed relating to uh, one of those breaches. And now I'll get to the core of my talk, Rethinking IT Security, where I will give you a metaphor describing the current state of IT security. I'll explain to you the methods being proposed by most leaders in the IT security industry. And then I'll introduce to you the method that I'm proposing, which I've decided to name the AEFIAT-LEOGIT methodology. <laughs> I'll explain the idea behind the name a bit later. But uh, hopefully by the end of my talk, I will have convinced you that the AEFIAT-LEOGIT methodology is the only realistic and practical way of approaching this issue. So the, the first data breach that I want to mention has to do with an Icelandic telecommunication company, or rather, an Icelandic subsidiary of an international telecommunication company. But uh, before I get into it, how many people in here are full-time IT security professionals? Majority of the room. OK, excellent. Uh, so before I continue, I just want to make sure that we share the same uh, understanding of what website defacement is. So in the simplest form, it's when an attack replaces your main web page with something else. It could be malicious, it could be vulgar, it could be a political message, or a simple hack by XYZ group. And there's a common misconception, by, especially by business people, that it's enough just to recover from backups. Now, but what we know what it actually means is that someone's able to break into your web content management system, and the only reason you know about it is because they decide to let you know. And very frequently, they will gain access to your, uh, to your server on an operating system level. They will be able to elevate their privileges. So whenever this happens, you should always assume the worst and hope for the best. So you should assume that all your data has been compromised. Like if you have database, a database server and databases, you should assume it's been compromised. If you have configuration files that contain usenames, password, authorization tokens to consume external services, you should assume that's been compromised. Um, and then you have questions such as, have, um, have other users been logged into the server? Let's say you have a Windows machine. Then you have questions like, are there a lot of password hashes that can be downloaded to be brute forced offline a little bit later? Or uh, if users have logged in recently, can the passwords be dumped from memory in a simple way? Or also, you know, if you can use patch the hash attack to access other servers that share same authorization, authentication information. Same thing goes for Linux or Unix. You have just different questions. Has the secure shell client been replaced by a backdoored one which logs usernames and passwords and what servers being connected to? Um, but in general, you should always just assume the worst. And also, then there's the question, is this particular server, is it also connected to your internal network that is inaccessible from the internet? Then you have to ask yourself, you know, are the attackers using this, have they used the server as a proxy to attack your internal network? Because as we know, most companies, they're very good at installing security updates on external facing servers, or servers facing the internet, but they're more relaxed in their internal environment. Now, getting back to this Icelandic telecommunication company, there was a pretty big data breach uh, at the end of 2013. But th the story starts two years earlier for me. Now, two years earlier, their main website got defaced. At the time, I called their head of IT security. I introduced myself and the company I was working for. I said, we'd love to sell you some consultancy. We'd like to offer you forensic services to try to uh, figure out if the attacker was able to infiltrate your network any further. We'd also love to do a security assessment on your custom-made um, web content management system, try to look at vulnerabilities, and assist you in fixing the, the vulnerabilities that we find. The response I got was, you know, thank you so much for calling us, but we're going to take care of it internally. OK. Now, 18, month, 18 months pass, they get defaced again. I call the head of IT security again, offering the same services. He says, thank you so much again, you know, we'll take care of it internally. Six months after that, they get defaced again. But then at that point in time, the attackers decide to look around. or. Technically, I mean, they might have looked around the first time, collected the data, used it for a couple of years, and then just decided to dump it at the end of 2013. But the data dump had personal information on a quarter of the Icelandic population, including clear text passwords. And uh, so there are so many things that are interesting regarding this issue, at least for me. But so for example, my password got compromised. Uh, fortunately for me, I tried to have completely different passwords for all the services that I consume, so I was not really affected. But this really opened my eyes to just normal people. And I guess I'll, I'll mention Advin's comments from this morning a little bit later in my talk, but 
there, there, I mean, I've lost count of the number of people that have uh, to have conversation with me since the data breach, and they've confided in me, uh, family members, friends, uh, coworkers, um, customers, and just various people at security conferences. There's a surprising amount of people that actually had a one master password for all services, and this was it. Or they shared the same password in multiple locations. And then you have uh, people like there's one senior manager who was working with me who actually sat across from my desk just to show you the, the impact. Now, she was a senior manager at the company I worked at. She'd worked there for over a decade, which means she had gotten secured awareness training every year for 10 years, and she'd had to pass a computer-based exam relating to the security awareness exam, or ex security awareness training. But still, she was using this password in multiple locations. So what happened is that she'd been working through this weekend. The data dump was dumped on a Friday night. She logs into her Facebook account on Sunday only to find out that someone had logged in as her and posted on her Facebook wall, maybe it's time to change my password, question mark. And to this day, she still doesn't know who did it. Now, just realizing that a person like that is uh, using the same password in many, many locations, it sort of makes you wonder, you know, what about executives, board members, stuff like that. And what makes it even more interesting is that this particular company, only a couple months earlier, they post a brochure to every home in the capital area talking about how seriously they take information security. So I mean, it's, you sort of understand why if people have a few different passwords, they use one password for sites they trust. I mean, you can sort of understand why they would believe they could trust that particular uh, company. Now, there's a funny side note that apparently it looks like someone may have been reading OWASP Top 10 and read that you, know, you should always store your passwords hashed because next to the clear text column, there's a column with a hash of the passwords. So <laughs> I've been entertaining. Now, included in the data leak as well, included SMS text messages. So at the time, it cost about 20 cents to send a text message from your mobile phone. But if you log to the web content management system, you could send them for free. Now, there's, there were a lot of interesting SMS text messages there. One included a member of parliament sharing confidential information with a news reporter. There was apparently one person cheating on his wife, which had very interesting visual text messages. So broke up the marriage, and yeah, it's, it, was, it was a sad story in a way. But um, so let's, let's get to the interesting points as well. Now, the Post and Telecom Administration in Iceland concluded that this particular telecommunication company had broken Iceland's privacy regulations. That was the conclusion. And the conclusion is from this year. I think it was, might have been February or March of this year. Now, one of the things that they pointed out is that they did not even implement the basic controls, such as uh, protect the user's passwords. So what do you think the impact might have been? Well, with the current regulation, there was no fine. Interesting, right? So this sort of might explain why the company was so reluctant to spend money on securing their environment if there's no penalty. How many of you in here have heard about the general data protection regulation that will take effect next year in May? OK, so there's a few people that haven't. So apparently, the general data protection regulation will take effect in May of next year. And if you would be found, for example, let's say you had a data breach and you would show gross negligence, like I believe they did in this case, then you can be fined either 20 million euros or 4% of your annual turnover. That's not 4% of your uh, profits. It's 4% of your annual turnover. So that can be a lot of money. So, I mean, imagine if, if that would have been in place at that point in time. If you were the CEO or if you were the board member, or even if you would have been the IT security manager, I mean, understand the potential effect. Like, this leaves me with questions such as, how could this website have been compromised so frequently and no one taken actions? I mean, if someone would have done even internal, simple security assessment of the web content management system, they would have at least have spotted the passwords, right? That's one of the first things that you look, uh, look at when you're doing white box uh, security assessment. So, you know, it's sort of why I, I'm pretty sure if I was the CEO or if I was a member of the board, I would have said, OK, guys, I want an external third party to do a security assessment. I want forensics to be done to check whether we're inter infiltrated network or not. But, and I assume most of you in here would do the same. That's because we have a certain amount of security awareness, which uh, turns out to be what you believe might be co common knowledge is not that common. And I'll address this a little bit in the AEFIAT methodology. So just out of curiosity, um, actually, I'm going to have one funny side note, or I think it's interesting at least. Um, 
so everyone in Iceland, I don't know if you know this, is someone's daughter or someone's son. So, for, for example, my name is Svavarinke Hermansson, that means I'm the son of Herman. If I had a sister, she would be Hermansdottir, or the daughter of Herman. So, and when, in any formal environment, we always address each other uh, by first name. Now, how many of you in here use LinkedIn? Okay. So, how many of you are aware that in June of 2012, estimated 6.5 million LinkedIn um, user emails and passwords were, were compromised? That was a trick question. Because <laughs> that's, that's what they believed until May of last year, where they found out, oops, 117 million. <laughs> so, tiny difference. And of course, it was the Russians. So, that's a bit scary. Now, and if you think about it, until May of 2016, only a small group of Russian hackers had access to this information. And after just after going through, you know, how frequently people use the same password in many different locations, you know, think about your parents, your grandparents, they're probably going to be board members or executives. <coughs> how many companies do you think the Russians might have compromised, installed backdoors and just gotten a real good foothold? I'm guessing a lot. Now, it isn't until the, all this data gets released in May 2016 that someone starts doing something with it. So apparently it turns out that uh, Mark Zuckerberg used the same password on LinkedIn and at least Twitter and Pinterest. We don't know about other, other places. So at least this tells us that the original attackers had access to this information at least for four years. And, you know, for me, Mark Zuckerberg, he comes off as relatively smart. Uh, I've seen a photo of him. There was some interview with him, I believe. He had his computer next to him, and there was a, a tape over the, the webcam or the camera's computer. So just keeping that in fact, I mean, thinking about that and seeing Mark Zuckerberg has such a simple password. He shares it on multiple locations. So, you know, what about your parents and your uh, grandparents or executives and all those things? So I think that's, uh, that's very interesting. Now, looking at the data, once it was released, I saw that there were over 12,000 Icelandic email addresses. So when I say Icelandic email addresses, I'm talking about email addresses with the domain name ansuth.is, which is the National Register for Iceland. Now, there was some media coverage in the US, uh, but in Iceland, there was none. So after two months, I had some summer vacation saved up. I started traveling around Europe, and I decided to do an experiment. So what I did is I put together an email, and I tried to I basically try to keep it as much in human terms as possible. And actually, if you go to the link, you can use Google Translate. It's in Icelandic, but you, I think it translates pretty well to English. Where I explained to them basically, I gave them the history. You know, I started the email by why am I sending this email, and then I explained that the password that they used at LinkedIn in 2012 has been compromised. I explained to them, you know, if if you believe you're using the same password somewhere else consider changing it. Also, if you believe you have, are using or have been using the same password with your employer, please notify your head of IT or head of IT security because you know you might have been compromised. Then I also go further into explaining uh, two-factor authentication. I explain you know, how to activate it. I also explain the risks. You know, if you have a mobile device, we have an application where you, when you have to confirm your, when you're logging in and you forget your device at home, then obviously you're not going to be able to log into the service that you're trying to log into. I tried to make it as simple as possible. I even created, uh, I referenced the page that I said I would maintain if I get questions and answers, which I did. Um, and then at the end, I also included a short survey. I'll cover the results from that a little bit later. But I did this, I, mean, I even got non tangible people to read over it, so it should have been relatively well understood. And the way I did this is I created a new email address using my private domain name. And it was a relatively long email address, so um, it would have been hard to guess. But you know, there are a few interesting points. Apparently, not everyone was happy with my security awareness experiment. So apparently, what happened is that um, as I started out sending these blogs out, I think it was on the fourth day or fifth day, apparently, someone calls the security officer of my employer. This is my private domain. This is my private time and everything. They call, they call my employer. And apparently, like he's, uh, I heard like he's like, you know, what the hell is Sava doing? He's you know, sending my employees emails. He's scaring them. And apparently, from what I can understand, 
one of the one of the ladies that worked there had received my email, and since she was scared, I'm assuming she might have been using the same password and environment. And she goes to her to the head of IT. I'm thinking, yes, you know, she did what she was supposed to. But then I had mixed feelings because the security officer was apparently not happy with the results. And I was thinking, well, this was two months after this data was made public. So in my opinion, that particular security officer should have sent out an email. And you have services such as have it been owned. So they should have been able to notify all the employees that had been compromised. So that person should not have been surprised receiving my email. Or at least they could have been happy. But anyway, after consulting with the head of IT security at my company, I decided not to send emails to the 120 other employees that had not received the email. So they're lost in my opinion. Oh, then there was someone who uh, wanted to sue me for breaking the privacy regulation. <laughs> if they only knew. <laughs> Sorry, like no offense. But, uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so there was apparently there was a one person, internet service provider, and apparently one of his clients had got my email, and she thought she was on a mailing list, didn't quite understand it, and he sent me an email where he was going to sue me, tried to call me, so I called him back. I was in Europe at the time. And I tried to explain to him, no, no, there's a one-time email only, and I explained to him why it was. So the end of that conversation is, okay, so you're going to remove her from your you know, email list. I'm like, dude, there is no mailing list. I'm, and, you know, she's not going to get more email from me. I said, okay, what, I don't want any of my other clients to get one. I said, okay, any of your clients that have already received an email from me, they won't get another one, but if some of your other clients have been compromised and they haven't received an email, they're going to receive one email, they're going to receive a email from me. And that was okay, so. <coughs> okay, more interesting things. Now, I believe within 24 hours of sending out the first batch of emails, for the first time I get visits to my private website from Russia. Interesting. So, I mean, obviously, that's an implication that they may still have access to uh, some of those emails that I was uh, sending an email to. And also, after that, to this newly created email address, I start getting a few uh, phishing email addresses. Not nothing too ridiculous, but I would uh, copy paste the, pa the URLs that I got, uh, paste them into Virus Total, and for the ones that I got, four antivirus engines were able to identify it as malware, and the others were not. So, I found that a bit interesting. Another interesting thing, apparently a more sophisticated social engineering attack was performed. And this is probably about two weeks after I'd sent out the initial email, where they used my private email address, not the email address that I'd created, and they sent it to the CEO of the National Register of .is on Iceland. And fortunately enough, Iceland's a small country, everybody more or less knows each other, so he called me up and said, like, Swava, I just got this email from you, you're telling us to go to some link to change our passwords. Like, have you lost your mind? I'm like, what email? <laughs> so it got them to send me a copy, and I was actually surprisingly sophisticated. So that was interesting. Now, as I mentioned, I offered people the opportunity to send me questions. And you know, when you've been in the industry for a couple of decades, for some reason, you just assume that everyone has the security awareness that you've developed. But here are some of the questions that I got. You know, thank you for the information. I have an antivirus product which protects my password. Isn't that enough? No. I don't understand this. My brother invited me to join this, but I never did anything with this, and I don't understand what it is. Shouldn't be allowed to own a computer. OK. I'm not using this link, so I would like to ask you to terminate it for me. You are, of course, financially responsible in case of damages from this after not talking about this break-in for four years. And then, how do I know I can trust this email? So and basically, and these are just a few of the questions that I got. And this is very eye-opening. You know, I think about the original data breach in Iceland with the Asylum Telecommunication Company. I'm going to try really not, really hard not to name them because I don't like public shaming. And then with the LinkedIn data leak, when people's security awareness is at this stage, you know, it, it's very frightening. So I did include a survey where I asked people, you know, please, I'd appreciate it if you'd participate in the survey and to give me your opinion if you like the email or not. So 97 people, uh, 9 percent of the people that responded to my survey, uh, they liked it. 2 percent claimed they didn't understand it. Half a percent really didn't like it. And then half a percent was a neutral on the issue. But you know, again, we have sort of similar questions. How could this happen to LinkedIn? OK, at least they didn't have clear text passwords, but they weren't salting them, right? And again, how can people really not understand a simple email describing the breach and potential impact and two-factor authentication? I didn't human understandable terms, in my opinion. And again, 
the really scary thought, how many companies have been infiltrated since 2012 by the Russians. So now I'm going to get to the AFL legal methodology. But before that, I um, just want to go over a few interesting recent, not so recent headlines. So we talked about the 117 million password hashes that were uh, leaked from LinkedIn. Apparently that, Ashley Madison, some other from uh, Troy Hunt's passwords, like really uh, 320 million password hashes they have been cracked. Uh, hackers gained switch flipping access to US power grid. 750,000 pacemakers uh, have been confirmed as having cybersecurity issues that could let them be hacked. Russian agents hacked US voting system manufacturers before US election. Again, LinkedIn maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Uh, hackers breached defenses of US voting machines in less than 90 minutes. Older news, the FBI warns, a car uh, warns that car hacking is a real risk, and Prime Minister of Iceland resigns after the Panama Lakes. Now, all those, all those headlines, is anyone here surprised? Exactly, no one is surprised. We know what the state of information security is, or rather lack thereof. So I'm going to use a bridge building metaphor for describing the current state of ad security. Imagine that we have 4,000 bridge builders. Out of those, 3,000, they get sort of hands-on training. 1,000, they go to university to learn bridge building security. Out of those 1,000, four take an elective class in bridge building security. OK, so let's take the 3,996 bridge builders, split them up into 500 groups. And let's take the remaining four that did the elective class and just let them work in teams of one. OK, and the reasoning behind um, you know, the numbers in that particular metaphor is that in Iceland, we have uh, over 70,000 companies registered. Over 1,000 of them are registered as IT companies. We have a Facebook group for programmers in Iceland. There's over 4,000 members. And there are three registered CISSPs. OK, so let's imagine. We have these 500 groups that are now starting to build bridges at all at the same time, right? And then we have four security assessors. They're doing security assessment at the same time. Now, whenever they find a security vulnerability, they'll notify the original team. And the original team will either fix it, or they'll say, you know, it's such an old bridge, you're going to have to buy a new one to get it fixed. And imagine that the security assessors, they're always finding the same kinds of vulnerabilities. Now, if you listen to a lot of the leaders in that security industry, and technically at when this uh, morning, now, IC squared, for example, they say the cybersecurity workforce shortage is projected at 1.8 million by 2022. In my opinion, whenever people are talking about potential solutions for IT security, it's about, you know, four security assessors is nowhere near enough. We need 20, right? I guess it sort of makes sense. Uh, four is not that many, and 20 is far better. And then you have other IT security leaders that are saying, you know, you have to look at it from a micro perspective, like I say, and you have to look at it from the company. You have to create, in your company, a security culture, a security awareness. And you know that could be good, but let's, again, let's think about the 500 groups. So let's say that 20 or 30 groups, they adopt to this. They sort of you know, increase in the security and bridges that they build. Or let's say 70 or 100, let's say 100. You still have 400 other groups that are still building insecure bridges. So the AFA legal methodology, the basic concept is the only realistic way to address this is to teach every bridge builder the basics of bridge building security. Seems obvious to me, apparently not to everyone else. I'm not okay with having uh, 40 or 20 or 40 security assessors, but the, I mean, if you have them, you're fighting an uphill battle. This is the only way to get realistic results. Now, before I continue, I, I did say I was going to explain the AFL Leibut methodology. So, how many of you have heard about a, uh, heard of AFL Leibut? The Atlantic volcano. Okay. Well, I was hoping for more people to recognize that. It stopped air traffic uh, a while ago. Now, seeing security vulnerabilities being discussed in the media, you see that you know Heartbleed or WannaCry they get all the media attention because they have cool names, right? <laughs> I, I thought I'd try my luck with this one. <laughs> no luck so far. So, um, but yeah. So, the only realistic way to address this, we have to do it asynchronously, and every single education level needs to be addressed. So we're talking about management, business, software development, system and network administration, board members of registered companies, 
auditors, legislators, and others. So what's really interesting to me is that if you look at the MBA programs of the Ivy League schools, like in the US, there is no mandatory IT and operational security class being taught. And considering the importance of IT and operational security, I mean, companies are going bankrupt, there's you know, a lot of fines. Imagine if the, the CEOs actually understood the potential implications. Then they could actually do something. So I'm not talking about that they have to stand, understand sorry, complex things such as what is a buffer overflow or formatting vulnerability or SQL injection. They just have to need to know how to ask the right questions and understand potential impact on the business. So for example, has a vulnerability assessment been performed on our internal external network? Were any critical or high-risk vulnerabilities discovered? What, were the status, uh, what is the status of the remediation? Uh, also having process-related questions. Now in my book, um, I have a list of processes. I don't have time to cover it now, but uh, yeah. And also ask for an IT security report, ideally standardized for executives. Again, if you have someone doing a vulnerability assessment or pen test, ask them for an executive summary for something that the executives could understand. But of course, in order for them to be able to understand, they have to have gotten this education. How, like, even thinking back to the, the particular ISAN telecommunication company, the head of IT security there, he didn't have any technical IT security certifications. So maybe he was, you know, he was really good at doing policies, processes, procedures, but just didn't understand the technical part. And don't get me wrong, policies, uh, process, and procedures is one of the cornerstones of uh, highly effective information security. But again, you really have to understand uh, the technical potential impact as well. And in Iceland, for example, if you want to be a board member of a highly regulated company, you need to go to the Financial Supervisor Authority and you have to pass an exam. So why not add an IT security or operational security questions to that exam that you had to pass? And of course, we have to support this. We have to have the training in place to offer it to them prior to introducing this. But I think that's probably the only realistic way of addressing that particular place. Now, if you look at computer science and software engineering, you know, what we need to do, and I'll, I'll get a little bit back to this a little later, but for some reason, education levels and the industry, they look at, you know, we have IT on the one hand and IT security on the other. So, you know, some uh, universities, they're now offering information security classes, but they don't really necessarily introduce it into their, their traditional uh, software engineering classes. Now, what I propose is that we teach all the professor basic IT and operational security and then make them point out potential vulnerabilities in the lectures. And also, the school books, they should not be allowed to have insecure source code. Or, you know, if you really need to, you want to save space, you want to emphasize a particular idea, okay, you can have insecure source code, but it has to be marked with big red letters. Insecure source code. And when students, they have to hand in their home assignments, then if it contains a security vulnerability, they should be failed, or at least get their grades lowered. Because if you think about it, if you take someone, let's say someone goes to university for five years, then they go work for a big company, and you know, during five years, day in, day out, they've adopted some habits, right? And then they go work for a big company, and let's say there's, a, let's say there's one hour training per year on how to do secure software development. Let's say they show up late, then you know, there's a little bit of whispering the latest uh, office gossip, and then they have to leave a bit early to pick up the kids. You know, I'm, I'm trying to paint the, <laughs> the worst picture here, but imagine, what do you think they're gonna do? Do you think they're gonna continue doing what they've been doing day in and day out for the last five years? Or did this one hour just change your life completely? I'm gonna assume they're gonna continue doing what they've been doing day in and day out. Now, there is, um, all the stuff that I've been talking about so far, I mean, I know it's, it's big, it's revolutionary, and this needs to be on a policy level and a government level. I mean, this is policies that need to be set. There's a lot of resources that are required. It needs a lot of cooperation. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. And we have to do it asynchronously as well. Now, there are a few low-hanging fruits, though, that we could start applying right now today. I was actually hoping someone from Cisco would be here. Um, so how many of you are familiar with the, the Cisco certifications and Microsoft certifications? Okay, some of you. So now, Cisco and Microsoft, they have these certifications so you can show how good you are, or at least you know the basic skill sets. Uh, for the Cisco Certified Networking Associates, there are nine different types of certifications. Now you have the one particular one, which is CCNA Security. 
I would say if I want to hire someone to run my routers and switches, I would want them to have a certification, and I'm, I have Cisco equipment, I would want them to have a certification from Cisco. I would want them to be a CCNA in routing and switching. Right? I and mean, that would make sense to me. Now, if you look at the, the requirements for that, there you have to pass the ICND-1 and the ICND-2. And technically, there is one exam that combines the two, but that's basically what you have to, uh, have to pass. Now, technically, they cover like a tiny, tiny bit relating to IT security, but it's, for my purposes, non-existent. However, if you look at the CCNA security exam, that is impressive. That's really impressive. So what I'm proposing is, why not make that mandatory of any CCNA? So instead of having nine Cisco network associate degrees, drop it down to eight, but make a requirement whenever you want to pass a CCNA that you pass the CCNA security exam at least within two years. Imagine a world where if you wanted to get someone to run your routers and switches, the only person you could get to do that also had a deep knowledge on how to secure it and maintain it, as opposed to the way it is today. For me, that's a, that's a pretty, Pretty beautiful, beautiful world, beautiful picture. Now, if you look at the Microsoft certification as well, they now have Microsoft Certified Solution Associate. And let's take a look at the Windows Server 2016. There are three exams that you have to pass. And again, they more or less do not really touch on IT security. If you want to become a Microsoft Certified Solution Expert, then they do offer, so basically you have to pass one out of 10 optional exams. One of them is securing Windows Server 2016. And again, looking at the material they have there, again, looks relatively impressive. And what I'm proposing is basically the same thing. Why not make it a requirement for just even a Microsoft Certified Solution Associate? Why do we want to distinguish the two? Why can't we just make, if you want someone to run your operating system or run your servers or whatever, why not make it a requirement that they have the basic skill set for information security? So, and in my book, I do also cover, I mean, I do put emphasize that legislation can be very helpful, especially now with the GDPR, at least in Iceland. Uh, this is gonna increase security awareness a lot. Um, I throw out some ideas that I know are also maybe relatively unrealistic, but I wonder whether you should maybe require some sort of an exam. Like if you think about it, if you, if you want, in, at least in Iceland, if you want to have a gun license, you have to have someone to recommend you, you have to uh, take an exam, you have to get some training. If you want to become a, a pilot, you have to pass examination. There are always all these sort of things that you have to pass, but apparently not for software development. Why not make a similar certification program there? So, you know, if you want to do, if you just want to use a computer, you still have to show the basic skill set. It's sort of like your driving license. And then if you want to develop software, but just internally, maybe you have a little bit more requirements. If you want to develop software that's being consumed externally or in commercial sense, higher requirements. If you want to work in the health industry, you know, like pacemakers, or you, know, you want to program software for a car, then there's even higher requirements. So, anyway, I'm, I'm throwing out a lot of ideas that I consider relatively interesting. And, um, I do have the book with me, and if someone gives me an interesting question, uh, I will probably give you a copy. Otherwise, I can give you a fair price for a signed copy. I do have a few books with me, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm shameless, I know. <laughs> so yeah, uh, who has the first question? Yeah? So that's a very interesting question. Uh, did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, you always have to prioritize, and if people are not security aware, I know it's definitely something you should do and you would want to do. Uh, there could be sort of a community project, and st I mean, because, I mean, I've heard of a lot of cases where people have copy-pasted code that actually had security vulnerabilities in them, and there are stories that you've heard that someone actually intentionally pasted that code because it contains security vulnerability. Uh, it's definitely something that could be done, or could be tried to be done. I'm um, not sure where in the prioritization it should go, but uh, yeah, it's, that's a good question. Yep? And I just don't fully understand GDPR. Yeah? But is there some way that senior management, if they're going to be responsible for a failure, is there some way they're going to be held accountable, or they're going to be... Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, so technically, I mean, by law, they are accountable for the operational security of the company. I mean, they're, they have to do the taxes, they have to do all the, they're responsible for financials regarding, you know, towards the owner. So by law, they are definitely responsible. The problem, at least until today still, is that they just don't understand IT security. And the question is, why should they understand security? You know, why do you know something? It's because someone taught it to you, or you decided to learn it by yourself. And if, if, they, if it hasn't been taught to them, then you can't really expect them to, to know it. So, I know, I know there's a lot of workshops relating to the GDPR, all the consultancies are trying to really sell uh, consultancy hours, so they're doing a lot of, well, they're doing a lot of work for us, but not as deep as we like. Yeah, so basically, uh, the way it works is that uh, the legal system, is, uh, the law is changing a little bit now, and you have to be compliant, and you can be audited, and some companies will definitely be audited, um, but obviously there are, like in Iceland, when you have 70,000 uh, companies, and the people working at the Data Protection Authority are not that many, then you know, obviously they're going to prioritize or do some risk-based assessments. If someone sends them pointers, I would assume they would follow up on that. I don't know exactly how it is, but I would assume that's the way. Um, and I also assume that, well, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some sort of auditing body that could certify you up to a point, S similar to you know, the ISO 27001 certification. Yeah, I, th I think it's going to be mixed, but I think the big question is sort of, you know, are you ready to risk it? Because you need to be compliant whether you've been audited or not. So if you if you demonstrate gross negligence and there was a huge data breach, I mean, like uh, like this particular Icelandic telecommunication company, I'm pretty certain they would have been fined four percent of their annual turnover. And for especially the big companies, that can be a lot of money, and even for the small companies. So once you hear those numbers, then uh, hopefully you. You'll react. Let's hope so. Yeah? Um, you cited the thousand IT companies in Iceland. Yeah. Do you think that part of the company formation should have a statement of information security? Sorry? And going into IT, you should have a statement of how you plan to secure and proactively secure I def before you get a, a, a license to actually practice a bit more. Well, I think that would be a great idea. And, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the GDPR or the PSD2 or um, ISO 27001, or even the PCTSS, all these sort of standards that are, or the NI, uh, NIS uh, thing, yeah, it, it always pushing in the, in the same direction that you should have an IT security policy, and ideally a statement that you should have processes in place, it should be ideally risk-based approached, and uh, so if you were compromised and you showed that you had a privacy program in place, you were working on implementing the controls, I'm pretty sure, you know, but you still just happen to be unlucky, I'm pretty sure that would I wouldn't be surprised if they'd forgive that or give you the, the lower fine, um, which might be 20 million <laughs> euros. Which, yeah, exactly, yeah. For some companies, that's pocket change. But it's, yeah. This is a very good question, and if you think about it, it's, I mean, I can promise you that the, the CEO of the Asylum Telecommunication Company or the CEO of like any company that's been compromised, they did not say, I knew it could happen, and I just was ready to risk it. It's because they didn't understand. And just from the emails and the questions that I received from the people that I was trying to explain, you know, how important it is to have different passwords to different locations, all those sort, and the strengths of the passwords, they don't understand it. So you're correct as the consumer, but at the same time, I think, the only realistic way to address this is from basically by the government forcing it into the educational system. And I'm talking about university level now, but ideally I would also want to introduce in high school, maybe even lower. And again, there are always different perspectives. Like if you go for the younger children, for example, it's more about, okay, installing security updates and privacy issues, being aware that whoever you're talking to could be someone else and just creating the awareness. Uh, I think the only realistic way is if we get governments on board. If you take one university and they introduce this or 
you know, one, a few companies or if it's just small units, then yes, they'll be more secure. But if you also look at uh, people are claiming like the, uh, there was hacking related to the US election, you look at the government, if, what about hacking in other countries? Is it important for them that the election is not hacked? If it is, I mean, this is sort of the only realistic way to start fighting it. So, uh, yeah, I think the only realistic way is to get government to force it. So that's sort of a, a generational change that you're about? So yes. Possi yeah, definitely. I mean, it depends, like, uh, on how aggressive you can be, how aggressive you believe you can be, because ideally I would, I would be interested in, you know, from this day on, like, one year from now, you have to have your computer license to operate a computer. <laughs> And then you'd have, like, uh, again, how realistic it is, probably unrealistic, but uh, you sort of need to force people. Yeah, the, sorry, you were first, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, just trying to follow along from that point, in relation to the telephone breach license, um, did the people whose uh, texts were compromised and they ended up, um, ended up uh, getting divorced or whatever, did so yes, there was there was a lawsuit, but it was covered in the media when a group got together to to sue this particular company, but then it was never talked about again. So it never reached the media again, at least. So maybe they were able to reach some sort of agreement or something. So at least they kept it out of the media. It's it's again it's the question like if you. Yeah, you have to, in Iceland, the law is very interesting. You can, you have to, like, in the U.S., they probably would have made, would have made a lot of money. In Iceland, it's the amounts you get for, for craziest things are very low, so it, it can be very difficult. And if they get something, it's, uh, it might not even cover the cost of the legal prosecution. Just, yeah. It's a good question. I completely agree you should be using static analysis tools. You should be using every possible tool you can, but you should not rely on that. You should do both. Because, I mean, even if you use static analysis codes, I mean, uh, tools, sorry, you'll, you'll find the low-hanging fruit, dash kill injections, the buffer overflows potentially, at least the obvious ones. Um, but you're not going to find logic vulnerabilities. And again, it's not going to make people choose secure passwords. It's not going to make pe people enable two-factor authentication. There's Yeah, exactly, yeah. So there's, I mean, I think the only realistic way to address <coughs> this is, is we have to force every bit, like using the bridge building metaphor, I think every bridge builder needs to be trained in the art of uh, bridge building security. Here's the thing, though. Like, if you if you haven't taken a class on IT security, you don't know this tool exists. You don't realize why you need it, right? Why should you spend like, oh, the tool exists, like Veracode? It's it's not cheap. You know, you can use that for static analysis. It's pretty cool. I and mean, the company I work for, they they use that. <laughs>